Hi, everyone. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today at the 2024 Sloan Sports Analytic Conference. Competitive Advantage Talks presented by Kager, also known as the Craft Analytics Group. My name is Ophir. I am a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you a very good presentation called Buzz Cuts, Insights on the History of the NBA Buzzer Beaters. Please join in me in welcoming Mike Lynch, Director of Data at Sports Reference, to the stage. Mike. Thank you. So, uh, really glad to be here today, uh, and thank you for being here. Um, as you could probably tell, I'm going to talk about like buzzer beaters um, in the uh, history of the NBA, uh, which is some research that um, I started a long time ago, uh, recently finished. Um, and so I thought I would start by just sort of getting into the why um, did I look into these. Um, I think it was about 2008 or 2009 uh, when I first started this research. Uh, was working in the research department at uh, ESPN back then, and uh, a big part of the job was just to put things into context when they happened. Um, for the NBA specifically, there was nothing uh, that could happen that was bigger in a game than someone hitting a shot at the buzzer uh, to win the game. Uh, back then, a lot of it was Kobe. You know, he was a very popular player. If he ever did anything that was going to be on TV, and you wanted to put that into context. And there was basically nowhere to turn to find that information. Um, and so I decided, you know what, maybe I'll take a whack at trying to put the data in place uh, so that when these things happen, we can say, you know, um, this player has done this this many times. This hasn't happened since then. Um, and th and th so um, started the work to put this in place. Uh, and first, I had to figure out what exactly was I looking for? So it's kind of obvious, but like uh, when you're working on a set like this, you need to have hard rules in place about what exact shots you're looking for. So like the Jerry West heave in the 1970 NBA Finals is not on here because one of the things is it's got to put your team in the lead um, and you can't already be leading at the time of the shot and we're not looking for shots uh, that force the tie like that West one. The other thing is that it has to truly end the game. Um, we're not looking for shots that uh, give the other team a chance to throw the ball in and respond. So like the Tim Duncan shot against the Lakers in 04 that left, what, 0.4 on the clock for Fisher. The Duncan shot is not a buzzer beater, but the Fisher shot is. Um, and then to build the data, so back in 08 or 09, what was available to me at the time was play-by-plays on ESPN.com that back then went back to the 0203 season. Uh, the play-by-plays themselves were not sufficient uh, to build the data because a lot of times um, a shot in the play-by-play -play is listed as like the time that it's released rather than the time that is left after it comes through the net. And so we'd use the play-by-play -play on ESPN.com and then check video basically to see was this a real buzzer beater or was there a throw-in afterwards and so it wasn't real. Um, and I sort of thought that back to 02 was about as far as I would ever get with it. Uh, several years later, I was working with Sports Reference, um, and I realized that this was the sort of thing that uh, our users would really like to see on basketballreference.com. Um, OCR um, had made it so that these archives like newspapers.com and Genealogy Bank had, like, you could from home uh, access hundreds of years of newspaper articles from all around the world, do like searches on like keywords uh, to find them. And so using our database, I could find every close game that was ever played, read newspaper stories on them, uh, and find out where these happened. Piece of cake, right? Uh, it only took about close to 10 more years uh, after that, but um, the tools were there that the work could be done. Um, and the data that I wanted to gather for all of these was I obviously wanted to know who the scorer was, Wanted to know what the game situation was, like was the game tied at the time of the shot, was the team losing, was it by one or two, uh, was it a two-pointer, three-pointer, free throw, uh, wanted to try to get the shot distances, know if it was uh, scored on an assist and if it was who the passer was. Um, 
I'll add here, um, all of this can be done with play-by-play -play data uh, from the game itself back to 96, 97. Before that, those play-by-plays just aren't saved or uh, anywhere in the public realm. So I had to use my own judgment to determine things like shot distances, if it was assisted, um, and things like that. So uh, just wanted to note that. Um, the data issues that I ran into here fell into four main buckets. Uh, number one was uh, clock disputes. Uh, figuring out what the shot distance was could be tricky. In one instance, I'm not sure who the shot maker was, um, and then to make the call on does this warrant crediting an assist to someone uh, was the fourth one. Um, so clock disputes, we have a great example of one. Um, December of 1946, the BAA, which is the forerunner to the NBA, is about a month old at this time. Um, I'll move on to another slide because this is probably really hard to read. Uh, but I wrote out what I thought was a really funny situation here that was uh, um, sort of showed the way that a lot of these games would end back in those days. So it reads, Bob Fought, former Notre Dame basketball ace, saw only two minutes of action last night, but it was long enough for the rangy Clevelander to uncork a long field goal, which brought the Cleveland Rebels a 49-47 triumph over the Detroit Falcons in a spine-tingling Basketball Association of America battle at the arena. Fought, who was sent into the contest when Leo Mogus, ex-Youngstown College and National Professional League ace, was ousted on five personal fouls, fired a long shot from near midcourt to break a 47-47 deadlock with a minute and 10 seconds remaining, and bring Cleveland its fourth victory in five home starts and six and 11 circuit clashes. Now, I'll note that the AP and the UPI say that there was 58 seconds left when this half-court shot was fired, uh, but like, the point stands, roughly a minute left in the game, why is someone shooting from half court uh, in a tied game? There's no, there's no shot clock at the time either. Um, and so optimal strategy probably would have been to hold for last. Um, and I'll also note that this sort of thing was not uncommon. I, you know, it's not like there was a lot of these, but probably at least five to 10 times that I just saw these heaves were thrown up uh, for no good reason. Um, here's a look at um, a nice picture from uh, the Rochester Democrat Chronicle in January of 1949. Andy Duncan is at the free throw line doing the granny free throw there. Uh, but I want to call your attention to um, the scoreboard that is over his head. You can see the score is 22 to 21. It's a little hard to make out, but there is an analog clock in between those two numbers. Um, and so move on to another slide. We can get a better look at, at something like that. This is 17 years later, game seven of the 1966 NBA Finals. The Celtics are 16 seconds away from their eighth straight title. This is at the old Boston Garden. Um, and I don't know if you can make out this clock, but like what is going on there? How, how are you supposed to know that there's 16 seconds left in a game from looking at that? Um, what the big numbers say is zero, five, 10, 15, and then zero again. And so it, it's sort of useful to note here that um, the origins of the league was people who owned hockey arenas were looking for more events that they could put in in these uh, ice rinks. And so they retrofitted uh, like uh, hockey gyms basically to play basketball in. Hockey, as you might know, counts up uh, to 20 minutes per period. And so that's what they're doing here for basketball, counting up to 12. So it, what that is showing is 11 minutes and 44 seconds have passed in this particular quarter. Uh, and remember, everyone in this gym is probably smoking, uh, including red. Uh, you know, so th these clocks are going to be impossible to read. And so you have a lot of confusion in late game situations. Um, the issues with these games didn't stop with just the clock. The buzzer itself caused a lot of problems. Uh, this is a game from 1954. Lakers beat the Celtics on two free throws by Vern Mickelson uh, with time expired. Um, no surprise, Red lost the game and it caused a huge fight afterwards. Um, an excerpt from this story reads, the argument was still going on a half hour after the game's end in the official's dressing room. At that stage, Noda Giacomo, uh, which was the name of the referee, was explaining the buzzer was a slow starting piece of mechanism and the early sound can be muffled by crowd noise. 
Again, th this was the sort of thing that was a trend in a lot of these games, I would say roughly from 46 to 55. It was just chaos at the end of games. The buzzer and the clock were not always synced, and so the players on the floor, the coaches, the referees, and the people that are writing these game stories are never quite certain how much time is left in these games when these shots are made. So the first like 10 years or so uh, involved the most sort of guesswork, like was this a real buzzer beater or not? Uh, but the data was very thorough from that point onward. Oops, I went backwards. Um, another issue that you run into with a lot of these, if you want to record shot distances, you don't have a play-by-play -play to look at uh, that shows what the scorer said that it was. Here's an example from 1948, uh, two St. Louis papers both covering the same buzzer beater by John Logan of the St. Louis Bombers. One says 45 feet, one says 38 feet. This is just an example of, um, you know, w when I'm listing uh, the distances that I put into this data, I'm making my best guess uh, as to which story felt uh, more comprehensive. In this case, I believe I went with the 45-footer from the St. Louis, uh, from the post-dispatch, uh, but the Star and Times said it was 38, you know. Uh, we'll probably never know, there's no video. In one instance, um, and this one kind of blows my mind, I'm not even sure who made the basket. This is uh, Bulls against the Celtics, 1969. Uh, the Boston Papers and the AP say that it was Chet the Jet Walker that made this shot. Um, and that was what I originally put into the database. The UPI uh, says that it was Clem Haskins that made the shot. And I later found an account from a paper from uh, Evansville, which had a very thorough story, ostensibly because Jerry Sloan had played there, was now on the Bulls. They credited it to Clem Haskins. Um, Haskins finished this game with 23 points and 21 assists. If he is the guy that made this buzzer beater, he's the only player in the league uh, to ever have 20 assists in a game that he won at the buzzer. And speaking of assists, uh, I just want to show this play. Carroll finds DeRozan. DeRozan pushed. Joseph in the corner for the win. Got it! Corey Joseph in the corner for the win! They'll review it. But from my angle, it appeared as though he let it fly in time. DeRozan turned the corner, saw Joseph in the corner. What? All right, so um, the issue that I want to bring up there is that there was no assist on that play per the official, uh, like, per the official, uh, per the official play by play. Um, and this is just to sort of point out that um, even though I had to um, make my best educated guess on all of that data before 1996, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's any worse uh, than what is done now because I don't know how you couldn't give an assist on that play. Um, and speaking of assists, and with the caveat that this is not official data, this is a look at the players uh, that have the most assists on these shots all time. I thought it was really surprising that Paul Pierce, who we sort of think of as um, a late game guy that's sort of looking for his own shot, is actually the leader in assists with five. Makes a little bit more sense when you see Jason Kidd there at fourth. Uh, Mike Dunleavy Jr., a little bit of a surprise there. Um, what I found is that about 47% of these plays all time were on assists. Um, and to see how that compares with the league-wide assist rate over time, you can see it's generally much lower, uh, which makes sense. You know, usually in these situations, um, you're not necessarily running plays. Uh, you get the ball to your best player and maybe get out of the way. The only period of time where the assist percentage on the buzzer beaters is actually higher uh, than the league average, um, it's like the early 70s until about the merger. Um, the only thing that I can guess there is that the NBA had lost a lot of its high-end sort of talent at that time. Uh, Julius Irving, George McGinnis, Rick Barry had left the league for a uh, stint there. So that maybe there was more teamwork on these plays, but uh, it, it also might just be a fluke. Uh, there's one kind of buzzer beater uh, where you can't possibly have an assist, and that's the game-winning free throws with no time left on the clock. Um, as you can see, there's only been one of these in the last 30 plus years. That was Jimmy Butler um, in the bubble playoffs against the Hawks in 2020. 
Um, my hunch here is that they added the tenths of a second to clocks in the last minute of the game in the 89-90 season. Um, oddly, there was two in the year right after that, but um, I, it just sort of feels like the specificity of clocks now combined with the fact that they look at everything on replay now makes it almost impossible for that play to happen, uh, which makes it crazy that that did happen uh, in the 2020 bubble. Um, sort of uh, some of my favorite uh, insights that I found when doing this research um, was things like the record, like most points that a player had in a game where they hit a buzzer beater. Um, I was really surprised by the answer here uh, that it was Fred Brown in 1974. Um, he's known as downtown Freddie Brown. One of those reasons is because he liked to shoot from great distance. He actually did this before the three-point shot. This was, uh, that shot was still about five or six years away. Uh, this is the only time in his career that he even scored uh, like 50 points, too. You might have been surprised that that last leaderboard did not include uh, Jordan at the top. A little bit less of a surprise that he's the leader here. Um, and like getting this result um, was like a very sort of satisfying outcome of doing the research. Like I think that everyone's hunch probably would have been that Jordan uh, was the all-time leader here. Uh, but now we've got the data to confirm that that is the case. Um, you know, you see Kobe and Joe Johnson tied for second with eight, LeBron and Pierce with seven, and then about a handful of guys with five. One of the weird things here is almost all of these are pretty recent names, right? Like the oldest players on this list are Jordan and Stockton. There's no one that came into the league before 1984. Um, why is that? We see at the time of Jordan's first retirement in 93, no one had more than four. Um, Jordan was one of those names. Kind of surprising that five out of Jordan's nine came after that first retirement, because that represents like not anywhere near half of his career games played. Um, I'll note that if you include ABA data, which I did sort of separate research on that, as of 93, the leaders would have been Cl Cliff Hagen, who had one more in that league to give him five, along with Barry and Irving, uh, a three-way tie with five each. Um, was this because there just wasn't many buzzer beaters before the more recent era? Again, that's not really the case. You can see the rate of buzzer beaters per games played over time has been all over the map. Um, very strange to me that the two peaks here are the year that they introduced the shot clock and the year that they introduced the three-point shot. Um, neither of them had any sort of staying power, though. So, like, I don't think that they move things in a meaningful way. It's just, um, it seems like a crazy coincidence that right at the time of two huge changes that you all of a sudden have all of these games that end at the buzzer. I want to point out one other thing here. Um, I list uh, the Trent Tucker rule there in 1991. If you're not sure what that is, I'm going to play another video here. So um, the Trent Tucker rule was inspired by this play. It was a shot uh, that Trent Tucker made, Madison Square Garden, 1990, against the Bulls. They throw the ball in. There's .1 left in the game, and he takes a three-pointer to win the game. The Bulls were not happy about that. Um, they complained. The shot did end up. Uh, they did count it, but they changed the rule uh, afterwards. That's why every time, you know, when you're watching a game and there's less than .3 left, they may say, you know, you can't shoot the ball. Um, it's because of this play. Also note that Michael Jordan was underneath the hoop watching that thing go through. Uh, let's fast forward to 16 years later, also at Madison Square Garden. The only thing that Vix can do is an alley-oop to the hoop, and that would be Eddie Curry. Can't get a shot off with one tenth of a second left. Let's go back to 1990. This is called the Trent Tucker rule. 
Trent against the Bulls. Michael Jordan and company got that one off. And the Knicks won it. Even an alley-oop? Can't get an alley-oop off? Well, that has to be a tip. As they throw it at the basket. So the great shot there, um, sorry, David Lee, the best shot there is Jordan. Once again, the buzzer beater king losing on this ridiculous play once again. Um, that game, same gym, Jordan losing once again. That's the only time uh, that we've had um, since the Trent Tucker rule started uh, that a game has been won on a play where you can't shoot. Um, so just really funny that Jordan was involved in both. Um, so we noted that there hasn't been like a huge change in the percentage of games that ended at the buzzer over time. How about the percentage of one possession games? Again, not much of a change here. You see uh, the shot clock being added drives things down quite a bit. Uh, but basically 8% of two-point games uh, up until the three-point shot was added uh, were won at the buzzer. And about 8% of games decided by three or less have been one of the buzzers since they brought the three-point shot in. Um, however, if we instead look at the percentage of games decided by two or fewer one at the buzzer, you know, so keeping the two points in effect, um, even for the three-point era, we again see, and we're using a five-year uh, average here just to help the trend show a bit more. Shot clock comes in, it goes way down. Three-point shot gets added, it goes way up. Uh, the 2005 rule changes, you know, to help more scoring come in. Again, we've had a huge bump since then. Uh, the caveat here is that um, in the two-point era, about, I think it's about 14% of games uh, were decided by two or fewer. It peaked at over 20% in the 1957 season. For the last, like, decade or so, we're under 9% now. So. Close games are more likely to be won at the buzzer now, uh, but games are much less likely to be close. And finally, since we're in Boston, uh, I figured I would present uh, the research on the teams that have made the most of these all time. Probably not too much of a surprise that the Celtics are the all-time leaders. They've got 49. Uh, the symmetry is perfect because the all-time leader in most shots made against you uh, is the Pistons. Maybe the worst team in the league this year. They also have 49, whereas like Boston, uh, I believe they're first place right now uh, in in the like current year uh, also. Um, so, anyways, uh, want to thank everyone for your time for listening, um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. I saw in one of your graphics uh, marked the uh, when they oh, when they uh, put the rule in where you could advance the ball after a late game timeout. Yeah. But that it didn't show very much change after that. Is there any particular reason why it didn't seem like that was affecting the amount of buzzer beaters? I uh, so first of all thank you for your question um i was expecting that to uh make a big difference to be honest it seems like a cheat code to like have more uh you know to have more games won that way right that you get to just bring the ball up to uh half court um i'm not really sure why it didn't sort of meaningfully change things um but i put it on there just because i thought that it was an important thing to note because i feel like it should have changed things Mr. Artis, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Uh, right side of the room. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, uh, just out of curiosity, what was the reasoning to not look at buzzer beaters that sent the game into overtime or second overtime, anything that tied the game? So I think those would be very cool to have. The biggest uh, sort of logical issue that I ran into there was um, would it opened up a gigantic batch of games that I ha that I would have to look at. Basically, um, if somebody won a game by 15 points, but it went to OT, 
you got to look, you know, what forced the uh, overtime. So I do think that it would be uh, interesting to, to note, um, and I wish that I could have sort of folded that in. They're also probably a little bit less important because they don't end up sort of winning a, uh, you know, like you don't necessarily win those games, uh, although, although you could. Um, but I do agree that that would be great information. Thank you. Hey, Mike, thanks for coming. This is a really cool data presentation. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Are there, is there more follow-up research you want to do to this, or are you just done thinking about buzzer beaters for now? Um, yeah, so at, I'm working on a, a few buzzer beater related things. Um, I, I also did buzzer beaters for the ABA, uh, for the men's NCAA tournament. I recently finished for the women's NCAA tournament. Uh, we have not yet published that. Um, the other thing that I'm working on is I want to get all of the uh, shots in the last five seconds. Um, I think I have finished like 1947 through 1955 or so, but it, it's going to take a long time. Uh, but maybe one, like, I think that would be a great data set to have also. Thanks, Mike. This was a lot of fun. Uh, what Thank is you. your all-time favorite buzzer beater? Ah, man. Um, love LaSalle basketball. Uh, they beat Villanova on their home court, 1987 NIT, Lionel Simmons. Uh, that would be my college one. Uh, for the pros, I'm, I'm a Sixers fan. I have to say, without a doubt, the most insane buzzer beater that I've ever seen was Devin Harris against the Sixers, um, where, like, Andre Iguodala, I think, like, knocks the ball out of his hands. He's, like, 40 feet away, and he sort of re-catches the ball and heaves it up, and it goes in. Uh, it's not my favorite, but it's probably the most impressive. Yeah, we have time for one more question. Hi, thanks for the presentation. I probably Thank you. not very feasible for a long-term historical view, but are you thinking about looking at the success of buzzer beater tries, maybe, and the different types of the shots, and like, like more of a tactical view, strategy-wise? Sure, yeah, so um, I wish that I could have the data on tries. Uh, un unfortunately, there's not a great way to get at that. Um, you can sort of tease a lot of that out uh, since 96, 97, when we've got all the play-by-play -play data. And if you, like, I feel like I've looked at, like, uh, potential go-ahead shots in the final 24 seconds of a game. Um, the league-wide percentage is incredibly low. It's something, I would think it's, like, high 20s to low 30s, or something like that, uh, you know, because your main concern is to not turn the ball over, maybe, and to make sure that, uh, you know, that you take that last shot. You're not really running good offense there, really. Um, and then your other question, I'm sorry, it, um, I feel like there was a second piece that you had there, yes? Yes. Yeah, more on the strategy side. Oh, the strategy, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's also something that, that, I, that I would try to look at, that I, that, that I would like to look at more closely. Uh, I have a lot of, like, I have notes on a lot of them, but not necessarily organized in a way that I can easily pull uh, uh, insights from, uh, but that would be neat to know also what is the best sort of play type to run. A lot of the times it could be like putbacks, um, what, you know, especially way back in the 40s and 50s and 60s when people are hitting the glass really hard, uh, you saw a lot of putbacks.